language more into that. Thank you. So I think it's I think it's important. You, you, when, when you bring up language, well, fluency, obviously, like we've said a couple of times already, is not necessarily about <coughs> doing the language. Having language skills are certainly helpful, but there are still opportunities for for miscommunications to happen. You know, I was actually just talking to a German colleague the other day, and and um, and. Even if something as little as, did I tell you that already, or have I told you that already? And he said, no, 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 you texted that to me. I mean, obviously, you know, so little things like that. But I was going to share just a brief story about when I first started working in China. Um, the first time I was over there work, doing work was actually working with high school students. And um, even knowing just as little about your own name and what that could mean in another language, um, if you apply appropriate tones to the way I pronounce my name in English, um, it can mean dog poo poo, a little stronger than poo poo um, in, China, in Mandarin. So just being aware of those sorts of language things as well. That's a good point. Um, not, not that you have to translate your name in every language, but um, the power of laughter um, and the smile seems to be a pretty translatable uh, mechanism. And being able to laugh at yourself, I find to be a very important uh, tool. Reed, you look like you were ready to jump in there, please. Yeah. I think, I think it's important to remember is Americans, especially native-born Amer native Americans, not native Indians. We speak in slang. We really do. And anybody that learns English as a second language doesn't learn it in slang. Uh, so whether you're working overseas or whether you are yeah, somebody overseas or dead, it's overseas working here or, or was not born here. It's like a second, I mean, it truly is a second or third language, but we do speak in slang. Um, and even different parts of the country speak in slang. I had a part I was working with in Afghanistan, and we had 130 people on staff. He was from Texas. Now, if you've ever had a colleague from Texas, they have slang that you never even heard of. And so the first thing out of his mouth was that dog gone punk. <laughs> and he got we, we got scared at this little government ministry. <laughs> but it, it was kind of a natural thing, and then he had to explain it. They loved it. But it, it is important to note that we do speak in slang. It's not always understood. It's often not understood. Good. I've also found out, I don't know you guys, when we run offices overseas, I've set up offices overseas. English is an international bank business language. It really is. As much as I would or we would try to speak in the native tongue, they all want to speak English. And so it's practicing their English. So we finally had to set up times where one day a week we would speak in the native tongue. That's the day I did go into the office. And, <laughs> and the other days it was English. So, right, great, thank you. Um, before we switch kind of to the first of the great questions in, in terms of employment and talent, um, I just I wanted to ask um, uh, like maybe Aaron, in, in your experience in the many cultures you've been, are there uh, ones that like, were a little harder for you to adjust to, or uh, are there things in those cultures that were like really hard to adjust to? I mean, one example I think about. Um, and that might spark your thinking is when I was in France. Like, I eat, like, I'm, I'm on, I eat at times. Like, there are times, and I'm going to eat at that time. And the longer it waits, I become angry. You heard that word, angry. So, like, God, can we eat dinner already? It's like midnight. <laughs> so, things like that, which are cultural, but like, are hard to deal with. Are, are there any that come to mind for you and your travels? Or are you, um, Guy. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a good question. I, I think one thing, um, and maybe to talk generally about it, but it, you know, I don't want to, to single out any particular area, but I think um, you know, the sense of, uh, sense of urgency uh, when it comes to business, I think can differ from one region or culture to the next. And I think um, you know, being sensitive to of those, uh, you know, the tendencies and, and understanding the, the way in which business is done. I think for me, um, you know, in the beginning, that was a bit of a, a, of a challenge because I think uh, maybe here in the U.S., uh, I think as we were mentioning, um, 
earlier that uh, things can be fast paced. I think perhaps you were talking about uh, things being a little bit slower in the south, so perhaps that uh, maybe gives me uh, some natural advantage in because uh, uh, I'm not from here uh, in South Carolina originally. But uh, I think, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe some sense of urgency from one culture to the next, uh, I think, uh, and being cognizant. That's funny, I never, I, I didn't think of that, but I, you, if, if that is true about the South, then that would be an advantage, because at least uh, a lot of the, in Asia, you know, take the time to build a relationship first. Um, Frank, were you thinking of something? And, yeah, one thing that's, for me, is universally challenging, similar to what Karen was saying, um, is, is the eye contact, the variations in eye contact across cultures. And um, that's the way that I, I, I understand whether my message is getting through to someone, I'm huge with eye contact. And, and if, if, if I'm not getting it re returned to me in a way that I process with my own cultural norms, it, it's, it's incredibly challenging. In, in many cultures, eye contact is something that doesn't happen. Direct eye contact does not happen, obviously, the same way that we do. So I find myself doing, you know, <laughs> moving my head around a lot. But for me, the eye contact is always something that's really challenging. Susan, how about you? Does anything come for you personally or people in your organization? Honestly, I think that the European cultures are easier, if nothing else, because they use an alphabet. You can find words that you recognize. There's some points that you can grasp onto and not be completely lost. Um, I was in a subway station, and when I say European, I mean ones that use the European alphabet. I was in a, a Moscow subway station by myself, and I'm like literally writing with this serial I'm trying to find the word. There, there's, the more you get away from even the alphabet, the more destabilizing it is. In, in Seoul, Korea, you look up. And, and, and you don't even know which, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's something really destabilizing about no words. Yeah, I've been up Seoul, Korea, that my first time in Korea, that same thing, I, I had this very detailed itinerary of where I was supposed to go and had the address up there, and blah, 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 blah. And like, I didn't speak Korean to the, the um, cab driver, so I, I just showed him the piece of paper, of course. He's like, thankfully, numbers translate. He just called him a mobile number and to, to the person and, we're meeting, I'm like, what, what was the problem there? And they're like, well, it's not written in Korean. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, so even if you think you're ready, you think you've done all your work, you know, um, and there's things like that that you're just like, oh my gosh, that just pulls the rug under, and you've got to be really, really flexible. Um, I just, Susan, if, since you have the mic, if you might, as we transition, I wanted to talk about the business imperative. So all this is nice, you know, if you're working with people from different cultures, you're going to be traveling. Or if you, you know, but why? Well, let me ask it first. Does and this this gets a little bit to I think your question is who cares? I mean, if you, why why should people that don't want to do this do it? <laughs> the bottom line. Why do companies care about it and or do they? And Susan, maybe you can start talking about what is the economic imperative if there is one for being culturally and globally competent. So, so Reed said before that we're already global. Our companies are global, our world is global. An example from Michelin, we were starting a new factory in Chennai, in India. New technologies, we never had a factory in India, and we needed to train people. The place that we spoke English and had similar technology was Spartanburg, South Carolina. So we brought dozens of people that would be wage employees, production operators, in this factory, which I just saw our, our um, India country director this morning, and she said we're now at 300,000 tires a year, so it's, it's working. We, we brought those folks here. Um, they trained alongside our Spartanburg wage employees. We had to welcome them, make them feel at home, make them feel a part of the team so they could learn and grow and be able to go back and, uh, and train other people in, in India when they were there. We don't have a better way. We have a Mexico factory that will start up in a few years. Those folks are coming to the United States to train. It's, it's really 
a great opportunity for people to learn, to open their minds, to meet other people, and it's a business imperative as well. Does it, the, so would you say it may help this one grow financially? Yes. Um, it's, uh, it's the fastest way to get a factory up and running is for people to learn from people that know how to run that particular machine. And those people are not usually in the same country. Yeah. It's interesting to me that while it, it's, you know, we talk about being a soft skill, this soft skill creates real results. Um, and so a lot of times you hear, like it said, it does sometimes take more time, which can be some of the frustration in Columbus. Our globally, our, our locally headquartered global company, so based in Columbus, a lot of times the people who work in global operations for those companies are frustrated because the management is American and they don't get it that things take longer in other markets. So, um, thank you. Reed, are you, you ready to jump in? I want to I hear from you. Yeah, I. So we're good for I think we have the same issue. And this area is becoming extremely diverse. We moved down here a little over a year ago for one reason, because of the educational system, because it is a diverse area. That's why. That means you have diverse from a pure business standpoint, whether you're going international or not. You have a diverse clientele here. And it's made up of different cultures, different religions, different ethnic backgrounds. And there's certainly a business case for that if you want to capture it, because it's becoming more and more competitive. True, I mean, Dean showed the map in Spartanburg in here. The number one international business school is in Columbia. Number one in the country is, is in Columbia. So it's very, the state has some negative connotations that, that others receive, but I, I haven't seen it. It's a very diverse, growing international area, which is critical even if your business is here. If you're going overseas, the culture, we talk about cultures. Yes doesn't mean yes everywhere. Okay? A nod in the head. You start working into your South Asian, you'll, you'll see this. And I can't do it very well, but that is an answer. You need to understand that. So it's going into these cultures to understand. As far as the language, I just have to tell the story because it's great. Berber was going, uh, Berber baby food was putting, I don't know if anybody's heard this story before, but I've been thinking of Saudi Arabia and they were uh, setting up a factory and they were wanting the production of Saudi Arabia, so they were trying to get into the market. And so they were afraid that the Arabic that they would be writing on. So they just used pictures because a lot of the, and a lot of the clientele was basically illiterate. Mm -hmm. So they did go by pictures. You do this a lot in, in market. And so they had three pictures put up. They had a smiling baby, a baby having a verbal baby food, and then a baby crying, right? And so they put it up left to right. Well, everything is right to left. So we had the baby smiling, eating the food, and then the baby crying. <laughs> if that's not global flu, that's good. Uh, Aaron, um, so you're a you're no a uh, homegrown uh, company based here. Um, you know, why does a company like that care about global competence, global stuff? I mean, what's your interest in that as a company? Sure. So, um, you know, I, I can speak for the part of the business that uh, we're in. So, um, we make uh, additives for plastics that can make plastics clearer, stronger, lighter. And, um, and just for instance, um, over the, in 2015 uh, to 2020, uh, the, um, the plastic producing capacity that's just added in China will exceed the total capacity to produce in either North America. Wow. Right? And so for, for our business, right, it makes all the sense in the world um, uh, to, to, to operate globally so that we're able to, um, you know, effectively operate in those markets. Because for us, um, you know, for my part of the business, that's where uh, a lot of the growth. I was going to ask a follow-up to the, this woman's 
this question about the frequency of the, do you find that it's easy, is it rare to find people who are globally competent, globally fluent, is it, is it hard for you to find talent uh, that has this expertise? We'll start with you. Um, I, I, th I think that is, uh, it's certainly a challenge, uh, but I would say that, you know, we, we, we cast that map because of it, and I'll talk about my, you know, talk about my particular um, you know, we, for example, I, you know, um, I'm from here in South Carolina. Uh, my, uh, my most recent uh, boss is, uh, is an expat uh, from Belgium who's now managing our Latin America business. Um, and uh, we hire in the markets uh, that we participate in locally as well. And so, um, you know, when we look at talent, um, we really open, open it up, you know, and, and try to find talent. Not, you know, Certainly here, of course, we look all over all over the world. Um, and Susan, since you're in career management, this is your field, um, how would you respond to it? Is it rare um, to find people who are fluent culturally? And how do you get, yes, but how do you train that into them? You know, I don't think that you're either fluent or not. I, I think there's a spectrum. It would be rare to find people as, as, as fluent as, as Brad or, or Reed, but any small experience that anyone has, having lunch with someone from another country, um, working alongside, um, having an international meeting, having an international experience, creates a level of awareness and humility. Um, one of the things that Michelin does is we have a, a seminar. It's, it's four weeks long. We, we hold it in our worldwide headquarters in France. We invite people from all over the world. There's usually about 100 people at a time. They spend a month with people from other countries, other um, new employees, more seasoned employees, um, learning about the company, learning about the international operations, but also, and this is really the fascinating part, creating an international network, going bowling together. Um, they have a few glasses of wine together. Um, they work on subjects that they, uh, of business cases. And at the end of the month, you have a person who goes, wow, what a big world it is out there, and how cool to be part of it and feel like I've got friends in my Facebook network that are, you know, worldwide, it's, it's not so hard to create global awareness. Well, let's see, wow, that's that's something I haven't got to either. <laughs> Thank you. And if we go even earlier in the talent stream, I'm gonna ask Brad, who the Global Fluency Institute, I know, has a global scholarship program that, uh, you know, next year will be about 900 high school students. Um, you know, what kind of things would you want to tell high school students that, that they could do to prepare most uh, effectively positioned for global uh, life. Yeah, well, when we do work with the students on this, we we really challenge them to get outside of their comfort zone in that proverbial comfort zone space, and and really just encourage them to, you know, identify with people who look different than them, who think different than they do, who have a different experience and background from them. Because as we're talking about all of this. A lot of the thing to think about is that global fluency, you know, we're, we're talking on an international scale here, but all of these skills trickle down into my interaction with Aaron when I first met him today, my interaction with Susan, you know, we're all <coughs> fluently working together and trying to navigate our own unique individual cultures that we all have. And so the same thing with, goes for high school students though, but um, finding opportunities, finding internships, if they have the opportunities and the means to travel, to have those experiences like Susan was explaining, um, by, by no means is that a requirement, but kind of identifying places where they can feel uncomfortable, where they can feel awkward, and we encourage them to, we encourage them by doing that with activities and such as well. And Reed, um, you've worked in this a long time. What kind of advice might you give to someone <coughs> young coming up, trying to think about how they can best position themselves? Large, large companies. And you put little kids in, and he 
they tend to do this, and it's in business with large firms, but there needs to be a focus on developing cross cultural teams. If you work across the world, you have to talk across cultural teams, and that doesn't work. I've done work with Deloitte, but we would have cross cultural teams. And I think that's important for companies here in the upstate. You don't have to be international. But look to develop cross cultural teams. Strive for it. It is your market. If you're not international, your market's going to be millennials. Millennials are much more cross cultural. We should just take a look around right now. Socially responsible firms comes into this. Millennials are looking for socially responsible firms. If you're going overseas, you need to go overseas with socially responsible programs. If you're going out, you mentioned the emerging markets. I read an article uh, last week that emerging for the next 20 years, out, starting now, emerging markets are going to be 70% of all business involved at the U.S. companies. It's amazing. It's just an amazing number. What are, what are some of the emerging markets that you're speaking of for those of us not familiar with? Uh, and the, the major ones are in Asia. Um, whether it's in Vietnam, well, it, it's South Africa, number one. And I don't say it's number one, but it's Africa, sub Saharan Africa. It's in Asia, in Vietnam, it's Cambodia. Um, India will probably be, people don't think India is a virgin market, it really is a virgin market. In the next few years, we'll have the largest population will surpass China, uh, both in population and first uh, national product and exports in a variety of other things. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to make sure we have time for the, for the audience tonight. I, I, we have another mic that can float around. Um, appreciate that. Thank you. So if you'd raise your hand, and if we didn't answer your question, just go ahead and say it again. That'd be great, because I wrote down three words. None of which I can read. So, yeah, if you don't mind, um, and then and then uh, and then we'll open up to, to anyone here. So my question is in three parts. You mind if I do? Okay. Uh, my question is in three parts. Is it rare to find um, people who have some local fluency in this area? Um, are employers really look? How many employers are really looking for this skill? And how should someone highlight on the resume what they do have in that area? See, I think we covered the first one. Is it rare? So uh, our company's looking for it. It seems like we covered that. Uh, maybe we could focus on the third part. How would you highlight that on the resume? Or, uh, I just want to make a comment. I think it's rare to certain the regions of the U.S. It depends on where you're at and where you're located. It's becoming less rare here, but it's still rare in my experience. Uh, it's becoming less so, it's becoming less so. Entering, entering the workforce now. Anyone else want to comment on the panel? No? Okay. One way we work, one of the ways, at least with the students that, that we work with in Columbus, we encourage them in two ways. Uh, one is to uh, make their college essay uh, reflect the global experiences that they've had and how that's changed them. Um, so this is a little bit for the resume. And the second is uh, you know, building your LinkedIn uh, profile and highlighting some of the multicultural teams you've been on, uh, any volunteer work you've done with uh, refugee or immigrants, any language training, um, travel, even if it's personal. Those are some of the ways we talk about. Other questions? Yes, right here. I just have a comment, but we put on the international, some highlighting international aspects of your resume. Um, not to your horn, but Upstate International had a company come and do an international resume course, mm -hmm. um, a one-day one day opportunity that they did during International Month. Uh, to bring to the public where they'll help either as an international person write a resume for here or for someone from here to write a resume to help them be more international. So if they'll contact us, we'll try to help connect you with resources to see that. Great, good idea. Thank you, Tracy. We have a question here in the back. Um,
Thank you. Um, I'm Juan Slade. I'm a diversity officer in the hospital system here in South Carolina, uh, in Anderson, South Carolina. I just wanted to, this is more of a point than uh, a question. Sure. Um, we are required as, a, as hospital systems and recipients of uh, federal funds, we are required to provide meaningful access to our services. And so while uh, the America's hospitals may not uh, all work either across uh, community lines or perhaps uh, across multi-state systems. There are many hospital systems across the country that provide services in various regions. Irrespective of the size of our hospital systems, we're all required to provide meaningful access to anyone that pre presents for our services. So while we may appear to be local in nature, we are quite international in, in what we have to do in the way we provide the services. So I think it's very important for us to realize that healthcare providers are challenged to make this connection on an ongoing basis. I'm so glad you brought that up because that we're seeing that trend in our region um, because you know the, an immigrant shows up to be treated and maybe it's a S Somali woman and the, the, the lab tech male lab tech I mean, you can't just say well if you're sleeve and I'm going to take your blood if you're a male. Um, huge. We did our global report which tracks things like interpreter requests and it's it's more than ten whatever quadruple over the last ten years or something. So we're talking a lot of our healthcare hospitals saying how do we tweak our global fluency training in a way that's relevant for um, for healthcare. Thank you for that again. I saw the mic go okay right next um, yes, I'm Amy Rosedow, and I'd um, be interested in any comments you may have on the impact that the level of local fluency has on the level of innovation in your Great question, and is there anyone in particular you'd like that to go to, or should I? Okay. Why don't, um, I know innovation is a very important really thing. Could we start with you, Aaron, or? Absolutely. I think um, the first thing I would point out is that uh, when I walk through our, our laboratories and our, and our research center in Spartanburg, um, and I walk down those halls, um, it's, it's amazing uh, to see the, the diversity and, and talent and, um, and, and the geographic diversity that's represented walking down those halls. We uh, try to, um, to hire some of the best and brightest uh, scientists, and um, it, they come from, from all over. They're coming typically here to the United States in a lot of cases to study. Um, but uh, I think uh, we rely um, on, on, on those uh, research and development uh, technical uh, innovators in our, in our community in Millican to, um, to do that. But then I would also point out too that um, uh, you know our because our markets markets are global. Uh, right, that uh, we do rely um, on getting insights, not just from, from here in the U.S., but picking up um, market trends and things like that that are happening. Um, you know, that they start you know, somewhere in Asia, maybe perhaps Japan or in Europe, and uh, being able to, to understand what's what's driving those, um, and then see whether or not they may apply in other areas and try to replicate them. So from our business point of view. Um, having the ability to, to respect and understand both the differences and similarities, I think, uh, and, and translate that, uh, that is that's what we always strive to do in terms of innovation. And I think um, uh, we, it's, it's something that we continue to, to try to hone and do better. Yeah, and as, as I asked Susan the same question, can we line up the next question? Um, raise your hand and um, back. Is it Megan? Yeah, so Susan, being, so question for you is, um, does being globally fluent or having a, having a very diverse employee base drive innovation, enhance innovation at the Yeah, I mean, for, for me, there is a direct relationship between all kinds of diversity and innovation. The, the, the biggest break to innovation is everybody thinks alike, looks alike, talks alike, and, and came from the same place. And to the extent that it's cultural diversity, ethnicity, um, gender, different kinds of places that you came up from or different kinds of fields of study. Every time you have a new way of thinking, including global thinking, it adds to innovation and it adds to company performance and team performance. Great. 
Great, thank you. So we have the next question line and stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Go ahead. Uh, I'm Jennifer Kutcher. I am the board chair of the New Charter School of the Greenville. It's a management immersion charter school. And you know, our, our mission uses different words, but it really it's you know, not only to teach Mandarin, but also to teach global fluency to these elementary school kids. So my question is coming from the position of the board chair. What would you value, what would you see um, you know, what programmatically would you want to be coming out of this program? Um, you know, what outcomes would you want the students to achieve to go on to high school and college and to your companies um, to start out from such a young age of being global and global? Great. Great question and uh, great work that you're doing with the students teaching Mandarin. That's a skill that they'll, they'll need. Um, Reed, did you want to respond to that? The microphone was handed to Reed. Uh, and I think Brad will go along with this. I'm an old horse, okay? Most of us are not as old as I am here, most of you are. It starts in elementary school. That's where it starts. And it starts by teaching it, by learning with the internet. These kids have access to cultures all over the world. And so it really needs to start there, in my, in my opinion, and start building that knowledge base and that understanding as they go forth, which would be do research and then discuss it and talk about it. And to me, that's where it needs to start in our education. Anyone else want to respond? Brad? Yeah, I'll add to that a little bit too. I think inherently, just the nature of your school is already instilling global fluency in students. Just, you know, the act of learning another language requires you to think about things differently, right? And it requires you to, to look from different angles of, of, of all sorts of things. So that, that in and of itself, I think, is going to be it's incredibly helpful for, you, for your students. But, but in addition to that, um, Giving those students the opportunity to, like, like Reed was saying, we have the internet, doing research, but also finding connections, you know, online connections through Skype conversations with other schools around the world, um, playing a little bit with some of those time zone differences that Susan mentioned earlier. You know, maybe you have to bring your kids into school at 6 a.m. one day, and then they understand that, wow, look at this, these kids in China are out on the playground because it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and they just came in and now they're talking to us but we're here barely scraping our eyes open this morning. So I think using technology is, is a really key factor, but just inherently by what you're doing here, you're already beginning to instill those skills. Aaron? Yeah. I think I would just add one thing, this probably comes from some regrets that I had um, when I was going through, through school and, and learning, trying to learn languages. I wasn't a very good student in terms of learning. But, uh, I, but I do think one thing that would uh, be interesting um, from a programmatic point of view is that as, um, as we teach different languages, um, also teaching part of the, the culture, uh, you know, arts, you know, and things like that, humanities that surround the culture from the land where the language um, originates, I think uh, gives a certain type of uh, richness to the learning that, you know, along with that just the language that would probably give, you, uh, give students an extra set of skills and um, an appreciation for the, not just the language, but also the culture. Great, thank you. We, are, we hear a lot, too, about the need for people who can work on teams. So anything is, you know, sometimes students come out of school doing their own thing and being great at their own thing, but as soon as you're working in an organization, it's all about working with other people. So we hear that, uh, whether it's cross-cultural teams or just teams. Um, yes, there was another question here. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Gibbs with Parker Poe. Uh, we kind of danced around this a little bit, but what do you find are the top challenges with facilitating global fluency and or mobility in your organization? What do you do to address them? It's a really good question. I'm maybe not going to answer it the way you expected, but I'm going to try. 
Um, I moved my family to France for five years. My children essentially went from being elementary school students when we arrived to high school students when we when they left, and my daughter interviewed for a position recently, and they found out she's in France, and they said, why are you different having lived in France? And she said, not the things you would expect. She didn't say I'm fluent in French. She didn't say I've traveled the world. She didn't say I've seen this or this monument. She said, I know what it's like to be left out and excluded because I spent so long as an outsider. And now I notice the person that's been left outside and I reach out to them. I think a challenge for global fluency is that we don't necessarily remember or we're not conscious of the fact that someone may be left out and you have to make an extra step. It's a little bit more work to bring someone in who speaks differently or slower, etc. And I think that's a really big challenge that people like you who are working on fluency can be part of the help with. No one wants to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> well said. We have another question from the audience. Yes, sir. So, my name is JR. I'm with uh, Accord Financial, and our parent company is actually located up in Canada. We have three offices across Canada. We have two here in the U.S. Uh, right now, we're going through a process of trying to be more collaborative on uh, our efforts. Most offices uh, sold their own product, uh, both in Canada and here. US. Right now we're going through a process where everybody sells the product as one. So what my question is, is for companies going through a process like mine, but with a more complex culture than America and Canada, what advice would you give them in, or resources would you give them at to learn about more complex cultures and how to do businesses in those theaters? Great, thank you for that question. Does anyone want to take that one? Um, you know, one perhaps piece of advice I might offer is that, um, you know, drawing on um, local talent um, that has a deep appreciation for the, the markets uh, that we participate in, I think has been a, a key area of um, Opportunity that I think we've, we've maybe uh, done, done well at, where we really try to understand what the specific market needs are and adapt uh, both our products and our approach to the market uh, based on that input and based on being able to together. Um, that. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, having that local experience gives you a unique insight into that market. That somebody coming in from the outside, um, uh, not there to guide you, um, you may not get quite the same same, same appreciation approach. So that, that that's one piece of advice that I might offer. Great, thank you. And I have a slightly biased uh, answer, but I do think that uh, you know they could do global fluency training. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I think one of the biggest pieces. You know, we talked about this this morning in our session. It's, there's, there's, there's these components to, under, to, to becoming global and fluent. The first is self-awareness. You know, and so understanding yourself, understanding where your biases are, and then acknowledging and having that, ex that other experience that Susan just talked about. So if there's any way that you can kind of class onto those things, that's really where you're going to start getting some traction with it. We have time for one last question, sir. Hey, I'm uh, Paul Greenwood, Partnership Life. Uh, I'm, I'm the marketing director. I've got kind of things thinking of. As marketing, you kind of talked about the Gerber, the images, and your business cards. If you're looking to market to a new country or a new culture, what are some of the things you think about before you go there? What, do you read, like, what, do you, what are the, your checklist of things to research? And then is it better to present your in English, you said English is kind of an international language. Was it better to try and translate it 
and how bad is Google Translate? Should you get a real translator? How do you kind of approach that? Yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll ask the panelists to do these uh, briefly. There's some interpreting going on. He <laughs> <laughs> speaks multiple languages, so we just try to. You talking about a foreign market or in the US? Yeah, international market. Basically, as a regional representative on the Go live there. <laughs> I'm serious. Don't decide you want to go to XYZ country or place. <coughs> My recommendation is that you go there and you spend time there. Understand. I also recommend that you find a partner that you partnership with. It's going to be very difficult to go and a separate partner. I'm not telling you how to provide a partnership or anything about, but you need an independent partner. Doing business in other countries is totally different than doing in the U.S. Um, so many people in the U.S. with your business, I'm going to take you to court. Why? How many times are you going to take you to court? You're a U.S. company, why? Well, you know, only 10, 15 years, <laughs> cases hurt. Because that's, that's reality of what happens. <clears throat> you know, if you're a big multinational, that's maybe, maybe different. But for companies expanding into international markets, I highly recommend that you find a partner. Um, you need to have, you need to understand what's going on, the social economic status within that country. <laughs> Uh, I think people have said they're going to expand into a, uh, a country in the Middle East. Well, okay, is it Sunni dominated? Is it, is it Shia dominated? What's the difference between the two? Okay. Um, these are critical issues to understand the social, economic, and geopolitical dynamics and what's going on within the country. To me. But I would, I would definitely live there and I would definitely find a local partner and start building. Okay, I'm going to have to unfortunately call this to a close, but we, we now have our marching orders. We're all supposed to go move and live in another country. <laughs> figure out what that country is, figure out who's going to pay to do it, <laughs> and then make that happen. But um, honestly, this has been an excellent discussion. Um, please, once again, join me in thanking our panelists, Brad. Uh, again, I want to thank uh, all of you for coming. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. And uh, before I get off on my closing remarks, we do have a, um, a drawing, uh, an umbrella presented by Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I think I'll be hearing draw a card. Let's see who is the winner. Greg Miller, out of Lyman. He just slid. Draw again. I'm going to work with it, though. Okay. <laughs> So here we are. Um, we are very fortunate to have this event today, um, talking about the global economy and the importance of global fluency. I hope that you learned many things today, and I, and I hope that you have questions that will spur you to keep engaged in this arena and take part in any activities that may come our way from uh, Upstate International. Uh, also, I would specifically like to thank Tracy Freeze for her effort here. Um, they had a great month last month with the whole upstate international effort, and this is just really, I see as, uh, as a continuation of that. So thank you, Tracy, for your time. Karen, Brad, Susan, and I've got a great thank you for being on our panel. Patrick, thank you for moderating today. We certainly appreciate you being here with us and uh, sharing your insights with us. So thank you for <laughs> I'd also like to thank our staff at the Top, um, Tiffany Tate, uh, Megan Zapp, and Missy Hauser for uh, all the work that they put in uh, to this event. And uh, they've done a great job, and I wanted to thank them. Just to wrap up the afternoon, I want to thank our sponsors of the forum again, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, GSA Business Report, uh, Spartanburg International Airport, 94.5 FM, and Surf, 
school in the, the upstate South Carolina in Innovation Language Management. I think I got that right for the second time. Also, thanks again uh, to Max and uh, again at BMW for their tremendous hospitality. Uh, just so you'll know what's ahead, our next Upstate Regional Forum will be back here. Dean mentioned that earlier on May 25th. Uh, we encourage you to reach out to others that you know within the region and encourage them to come. Um, this is our future growth scenario analysis project and it's being conducted in partnership with Upstate Forever and the Raleigh Institute of Furman University and other regional partners. I hope you will join us for that event. Finally, thanks to all of you for giving time today for attending and be a, being a part of this collective conversation that we're having, uh, for helping develop relationships amongst us, and for, uh, and for supporting our communities and our businesses that do, do good work here in the upstate. I hope you will stay with us uh, after we um, are through right now uh, to take advantage of the networking opportunity. We do have refreshments out in the uh, BMW Central Gallery. And so again, thank you and that is adjourned.